Yeah, it was a great start. I think that when we talked about this leading up to the game, that's um, the start we were looking for for sure. And I think the combination of um, like the, and the experience and then the scheme and everybody coming together. I, watching the film, they played really hard. They played fast. They played decisive. Similar to the way that we were talking about them uh, leading up to the game. So, um, you know, good first start, but that just means we can do it. Now we've got to bring it every week. Philosophy in the back seven where he doesn't, you know, he believes the starters are the starters for a reason for the most part. Doesn't like to rotate a lot. Like Tommy played every play, I think. Victor Corners played, starting corners played almost every play. Um, was that a, like, did you like that when you were meeting with him? Do you like that philosophy? Was that one of the reasons you wanted to bring him in? Well, I think this game was unique in that we only played 49 plays on defense. So, certainly you want to. Established roles, but I think you're going to see more depth play moving forward. Well, third row left, Dan Holt, the left Warriors. Ryan, you said yesterday on VTN about how Jackson you know, impacts everybody on the offense. How does he do that, and how do you guys have to account for that if he's not out there? Well, he's just such an impact player. You know, he can, as you saw last year, he can turn a five yard completion into, you know, whatever. Um, he's just so explosive. And, you know, because of that, when you have a playmaker like that on the perimeter, it just has such an impact on the entire game schematically across the board. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just the impact he makes. He's such a great player. I know you're hoping to get him back this week. Do you have to balance in your mind of, okay, maybe we should rest in a couple weeks and make sure he's fully healthy before he comes back? Yeah, we, we you know, I leave it up to the doctors and, and the medical professionals. But, yeah, we will not bring him back if there's any risk of him getting hurt further for the future. Um, so we'll make sure he's 100% before we put him back in the game. Yeah. Fourth row middle, Pat Murphy, 24-7 sports. Ryan, you talked about having to win every week here at Ohio State. You had this big game this week, a lot of hype around it, come out against a non-Power 5 team. How do you keep the same intensity, same everything you need for for a week like this after coming out something? Yeah, I, th I think um, you guys have probably heard me use that term, competitive stamina. And I thought that uh, that showed up in the game um, uh, on Saturday night. And the way that we played in the second half and certainly in the fourth quarter uh, was tremendous because we knew we were going to be in those styles of games when you're playing against really good opponents. Uh, we were in some of those games last year. We did okay with other games. We didn't respond like that. We did the, uh, on Saturday night, and that was a job well done. But that doesn't mean anything this week. You know, we say it all the time after a Sunday practice. Uh, once we walk through those doors and, and practice is over, we head up to victory meal. The game is done from the week before, no matter what happens, good, bad, or indifferent, um, because we have to move on because nothing we did last week matters. Uh, and it goes back to that term competitive stamina. Can we bring it every single week? And you've heard you know, us say this and coaches say it all the time, but we create our standard. You know, what is our standard? So um, it's been about us, always has been about us, and we'll continue to use that message this week. And you talked after the game, and you mentioned a few times, CJ's not focused on stats, he wants to win. Is that something you've seen from quarterbacks as they get into their second, third year playing, starting, whatever it is, or, or is that a little bit unique to him? Um, I mean, everybody's a little different, but uh, I think what makes CJ unique is – um, a lot of things, but he's um, a special young man. He, um, there's a lot to CJ. He's very deep, uh, certainly an excellent player, but uh, I think the impact that he's making on this program um, has been significant, not just on the field, and you could feel that on Saturday night. Fourth row right, Tony Gerben, Buckeye Hunt. Ryan, uh, Jim addressed the Lincoln Rays and playing time after the game, saying they wanted to ride the hot hand. This isn't necessarily about Josh, but is, is it fair to say there's a lower tolerance for mistakes defensively now, or is this a product of depth, or is it a combination? Um, no, I, I think it's a combination of all of the above. Yeah, and then you know, when you get in that first game and you don't have a lot of the bats, you have 49 plays, um, I think more of those things come to the forefront, come to the surface. But um, no, we're going to need Josh. Josh is going to have to play for us, and he'll play a significant amount this year for sure. Message you know, I don't know. You'll have to ask them, you know, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that the guys played on defense and we'll have to continue to build on that. But um, the good news is we have really good depth, you know, across the board and certainly on defense and in the secondary. So, um, you know, those guys are going to play. And when they get their opportunity to play, they got to make a count. And that's what being at competitive excellence is. You know, we have these. Uh, terms that are part of our culture, and one of them is that competitive excellence. When your number's called, do you make the play, yes or no? Um, and so, you know, that's what we're looking for. Right next door, Rob Holler, Columbus Dispatch. Ryan, when you get a guy nicked up like Jackson, uh, I know you defer to the medical people, but how hard is, is it as a coach when a kid really wants to get back in there, whether it's during the next week's practice or during the game? So how do you deal with that sort of emotion? Like yeah, that's hard. I mean, especially in big games like that, when someone's worked so hard, 
for that moment in such a big game. And Jackson certainly enjoys being in big games. He thrives in it. Um, but we first, like you said, go to the medical professionals and say, you know, can he play or not? If the answer is no, the answer is no. If the answer is yes, the answer is yes. If it's somewhere in between like that, we got to kind of see how he does here. Then it depends on um, kind of the maturity of the player. You know, and with Jackson, um, you know, we trust Jackson, so we wanted his feedback. And you know, we tried to see if he'd get in there and play and then just said, you know, I'm just not going to be at my, my best here. I don't want to put the team at risk. And so you know, we have a, a more experienced guy who's played. You can kind of trust him a little bit to give you some feedback if it's one of those things we're trying to figure out. But, um, but at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to the doctors and the, the trainers. You've done this a long time. What impact is a, is a serious injury to a Guy or any guy have on the team. I know it's next man up, but like to the vibe of the team, what does that do? Um, you know, like you said, you have to kind of move on, and, and there's just different things that happen to you. And, and we talk a lot about the events that, that are going to happen, the adversity that's coming our way. And the only thing that we can re you know control is our response. There's nothing we can do about what happened, um, whether it's you know a, a moment in the game, the score of the game at halftime, or something that happens to your teammate like that. And so we try to focus on the response um, so that we get the best outcome that we want. With that being said, it's not always easy, especially when you have a leader and someone who makes such an impact. So, um, you know, some hurt more than others, some situation are harder, harder than others, but I thought our, our, our team did respond, you know, and they, uh, some guys stepped up, certainly saw what X did and, and some of the other guys, and that, that was good. So, um, you know, you just, when you go into those first games, you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, if you, if you told me in the national championship game, the first game, Trey Sermon's going to break his collarbone or uh, the first, you know, whatever few plays of the game, Jackson's going to be out of this one, I'd be like, oh, my God. Um, but those are the things that happen. You have to have plans in place for when those things occur. Second round right, Nathan Baird, Cleveland.com. As you reevaluate this, what did you see from some of those other receivers and um, what's going to have to be better for them going forward? Yeah, no, I, I thought uh, there were some good plays, um, some ones we just missed on. And... Uh, I think there was there was a couple of protection things, not many, but early on there was there was a couple of things, and then um, you know just could have been cleaner early. And then I thought you know we were nine of ten there at the end and made some nice plays and kind of got more to a rhythm in the second half. Um, so yeah, there's some things we do, certainly just technically that we got to clean up, and um, you know a lot of those guys that was their first time playing other than the Rose Bowl uh, in, in that type of environment. So um, a lot of good things out there, but a lot to build on. We, know, we still got a lot of a lot of improvement to make. Certainly know where we need to be. Speaking of guys playing for the first time, I know Donovan Jackson had played before, but obviously a, a big start against uh, what was going to be a pretty good defensive front. Um, your evaluation of what he showed physically in that first game? Yeah, uh, same thing. Had some really good plays. Had some plays he wants back. Uh, but for the first game against a very veteran defense and veteran front, um, uh, solid job. Solid job. Um, I think he graded out a champion. And, um, and especially the way that we played in the fourth quarter, he was a big part of that. CJ and, and the, the younger receivers, it seemed like a couple times maybe he was expecting them to be maybe a little shallower than they were, or the one that was behind Jackson, or Mecca, excuse me, maybe he thought Mecca might sit there instead of keep going with his route. Just how long does it take, I guess, for a quarterback and newish receivers to kind of get on the same page when you're trying to determine the landing marks and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, CJ and Jackson certainly have a great chemistry there. Um, and you know, CJ and all the receivers have been working hard, um, you know, to, to get on the same page. And, and they are. They, they've done a nice job. They've built great chemistry. And now you just have to put it on the field. So uh, there were some plays that, that uh, weren't executed well enough, and we've got to get that fixed. But um, we've seen it in practice done the right way. And so um, we know that they can do it. It's just a matter of going and do it on the field. Uh, it looked like Luke had a boot on his foot walking out of the field. Um, is there anything serious with him or are you just managing something with Luke? Yeah, um, you know, when you come out of those physical games like that, there's always bumps and bruises and things that we want to keep an eye on, but uh, but nothing uh, long-term there. If you had, uh, I guess the contingency plan up front, if you had to put a new center in, is it Matt, is it Jacob, and then if it's Matt, that who's the guard? Right. Yeah, so when Matt went down, Enoch came in and actually gave us some good good plays there. We had a, a counter play where he came around, did a nice job, and, and I think we picked up about eight or nine yards on that play. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be one of the two. We'd either move Matt to center and then move Enoch over to guard, or, or you bring Jacob in. Um, so those are our two options there. Over to the right, uh, Don Berry, WBNS TV. Thank you. 
Uh, Coach, after the game, you said you thought that the way that you guys won that game and had to you know, get it done in the, in the fourth quarter that would pay dividends down the road. Learning to win that way, how important was that? And was that what you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, Coach Freeman talked about it after the game that their uh, game plan was to, you know, shorten the game and run the ball and control the clock and, and limit, our, limit the possessions on our offensive side of the ball. And so when teams want to do that against us, we have to be able to win in those games and respond. And, uh, and that's something that's a little bit of a common theme for us. And so uh, being able to run the football, stop the run, control the game in the second half and play good defense is what we have to be able to do. And we did that. Um, and in a physical game when you're not going to get as many plays. So um, I think looking back, we could have been more efficient, you know, certainly in the first half on offense, because every play matters in those styles of games. But um, I thought the attitude was excellent. I thought the toughness was excellent. I thought the way that we played, uh, we took care of the football, we tackled well. Those are the things you need to do in, in opening games. And certainly with the help of the crowd, we were able to kind of, um, you know, push through in the fourth quarter. And I think it was a seven seven minute drive there in the fourth quarter where uh, typically in the past we'd be going a little faster and you know maybe trying to score a little faster but you know we were controlling the game and we felt like if we scored there we could make it a two score game and if we got one more stop the game was probably over and um, again that's not typically how maybe we've done things in the past here but when you're playing good defensively and you're running the football a win's a win. Do you subscribe to the theory you make the most improvement from game one to game two and if so where do you want to see the biggest improvement this week? Um, I, I think that's a little bit of coach speak, you know, but, but I think that um, the reason why people talk about that is because when you are in the preseason, you make a lot of assumptions based on going against your defense or what guys are going to do. But then once you get on the field, you realize what's real. And, uh, and then you have to be able to make those adjustments and figure out what that is, um, kind of wake some guys up. So we'll see. Uh, I, there are certainly a lot of things to improve on. The issues are always there, and, and we've got to get those addressed. And, and that's the key, you know, when, when, whether it's week two or week five or week seven or week ten, you know, we have to be able to make those adjustments, figure out what those issues are, and get them addressed. And, and usually it's, like I say all the time, when there's issues, it's one of three things. It's either coaching, it's execution, or it's personnel, and so, um, or, or scheme. Um, and, you know, once you identify what those are, you've got to get them fixed. And, and then the, the test is on Saturday. No, I'd rather not yeah, get in because once I start getting into that, and then I have to kind of do that for everybody, and so we've kind of keep, kept it um, just available and unavailable, and I try to do the best I can to at least give you an idea what's going on, but not give details of the guys. Uh, third row right, uh, Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Rowe. Ryan, when your defensive line plays the way it does in the first time out, what does that do to your defensive regime? Are you even a little surprised at times by, by how good this defensive line looks this early in a new system change? Oh, it was certainly great to see the play the way that they did. Uh, we've seen a lot of that in the preseason. We've seen a lot of that last spring. Um, guys in the backfield making plays. One of the things that I thought was great in the game was the first play was an explosive play. And I think the easy thing to do would have been like, oh, here we go again. And we've talked a lot, long and hard. I know the defensive side has, and I've talked to the defense that, you know, with our style of defense, at any point we can get a negative play, get them off schedule, and either force a field goal or force a punt because um, of, of the different styles and the scheme that we run. And that's exactly what happened. I think they picked up three on first down, and then second and seven, Mike gets in the backfield, creates a negative play, third and long, uh, force a field goal. We're off the field. We've got a lot of energy. We moved on. Nobody had their heads down. There was no panic. You know, they believed in it. And, um, and I think that's, that's Jim's mentality is, you know, give me a yard and we'll defend it. Um, so that was great. But, but, yeah, to see, the you know, the defensive line uh, win the line of scrimmage was, uh, was excellent in game one. Two in the weeds, but I think Notre Dame was over eight on third and more than seven. Uh, seemed like last year there were too many times where third and eight was pretty good off the field. Is that one of those marks where you say, okay, I did the, I, I, we've made real defensive progress through the offseason, being able to get off the field when we need to? Well, we did in the first game, but that means nothing moving forward. Yeah, I mean, we certainly have not arrived. And we only played 49 plays, and that was great, but uh, we had a lot of football to play. But um, for game one, it was well executed, but now we got to do it again this week. Turnover battle Saturday with no turnovers for either side. Just how significant was that to you, and how important is that turnover battle between your team? Well, oh, when you're playing against a team that wants to run the football, it's you know usually what they're going to take care of the football a little bit more. You know, there's less risk there. You know, they want to control the game. 
And there was a lot of field position play back and forth. You know, there were some opportunities in there where maybe in the past I would have gone for it. You know, early on, I think it was a fourth and three around the 40-yard line. I think the year before, we went for it against Oregon. Uh, didn't do that. Decided to pooch punt, got it inside the 10. I think we had four punts inside the 15-yard line. So you're playing the field position game. When you're playing against a team that wants to run the ball, uh, you have to be smart because all it takes is one turnover. And, you know, you could be up against it. Um, so we, we tried to do the same thing, you know, run the football, take care of the football, and, and win that style of game, which is a different style of game than maybe we've been in in the past. And we knew that we had to be able to do that if we want to get to where we need to be. Imagine then offensively talking about running the ball, just um, going into this week's game, next week's game in Toledo, just how do you plan on managing the running backs between uh, Travion and mine there? I know they split carries for the majority on Saturday. Yeah, we'll move forward the same way. Uh, I thought they really complemented each other well. But they both really went, ran hard in the fourth quarter after looking at the film. I mean, I felt it when we were uh, on the field. But after watching the film, boy, it was, uh, it was pretty impressive to watch those guys run that way. And they, and they took care of the football. And that was a huge challenge for them. That's their number one job um, in this offense is to take care of the football. Well, I think anytime you come in in an environment like that, you prove that you you, know, you belong. You certainly did. Uh, but now, what's the response to that? You know, is it okay? I'm here now. I, I start to feel good about myself, and I take a step back and gear down, or do I continue to build on that? And now show that I can be consistent. Because if you want to be one of the better players in the league, which he certainly has a cup, the ability to do, you know, he's got to bring it every week. And that's what the expectation is. So it's one thing to flash in the game. It's another, it's another thing to be consistent throughout um, you know, the entire fall. Uh, front row right, Austin Ward, Rivals, 97.1, the fan. Ryan, what was the degree of difficulty on that CJ throw to Mayan on the touchdown drive? That's as good as I've seen. Yeah. I mean, that, the difficulty on that one was really hard. He's going to his left. He got flushed. Uh, first off, um, you know, he did a great job getting out of the pocket. He spun out of the pocket. Uh, Mayan came back. It was a throw against the sideline, going to his left, and probably the only place he could possibly fit it. And then Mayan had to catch it clean, otherwise, you know, because there was so much, so little margin for error there. Um, you know, big time play in a big spot. I think it was third and three. You know, and uh, got flushed, and, um, and and he made another play like that on the sideline to Omeka. Um, I think in the third quarter, two really good movement throws. Those, I was thinking about that a couple times with spinning out inside. Justin maybe do that way more, and Dwayne had some of that. Is that when you've talked about him using his legs? Is that the stuff that's more important to you than him actually running, carrying downfield? I mean, every, every play has a different set of circumstances. Certainly, the situation in the game down in distance, um, but extending is is a big part of it because it allows receivers more time to get open downfield. Uh, but I think if you watch the move, he's moving different, and I think that's a tribute to him and Coach Mick. But uh, when you look at the numbers on the GPS of how fast he's moving, when you just watch his quickness and his overall strength, his body looks different. And, uh, and that, that paid off on, on that drive for sure. Uh, right next door, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Brian, as far as Jackson and, and him being evaluated, is there an idea on when he might be able, how he might be able to practice this week or anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be kind of uh, as the week goes on, we'll get a better feel for it, you know, I think. Um, Again, I can't really give much details on that, but we'll we'll keep evaluating this week and see how it goes towards the end of the week. And ask about another guy from Rockwall on the other side of the ball. You guys are pretty selective with transfers, and I was wondering when when you were looking at, at Tanner and talking with him uh, back in, in January, what 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 impressed you about him? What decided that he was a good fit? Well, he came highly recommended from uh, Jim and um, and Jackson. They both knew him and uh, made a few calls on him. And when we went to the three safety system, uh, we knew that we needed to bring in, um, you know, more nickels and safeties. And uh, watching him play last year, he's a veteran, ex you know, experienced guy. But but he fit our culture just by the way he immediately stepped in. Um, he really um, embraced our culture. He uh, has been really helpful to the guys. He's kind of like a coach on the field. And uh, like you said, there's not a lot of guys that fit our culture that way. You know, he and Chip both stepped in this year and did a nice job. Um, you know, just assimilating to the program and. Um, because it's not easy to do here. Just the impact he's had this offseason in the opener, having a guy with the level of experience he has in this defense and, and what kind of impact they have made um, out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jim, who, uh, you know, has a few guys in the sports staff, GAs and guys that have been with him who know the system, 
helped early on, but, but certainly having Tanner there who knew the system with the, the secondary guys uh, made it a lot better because you know, he's out there working extra with the guys, teaching them. Again, he's like a coach in the field, so um, that certainly shortened the time of learning the, the scheme. Experience both as a player and as a quarterback's coach. Just how many weeks do you typically see it take for a quarterback to kind of get comfortable with new receivers? Um, it, it varies. Yeah, it varies. I wish I could kind of give you a, a number, but um, it varies. Yeah, and I thought there were some really good ones. I thought the throw and catch on the first touchdown, the, the timing was just excellent between he and Emeka. Uh, I thought there were some other good ones too between he and Marvin. Um, the timing on the, the throw and the touchdown pass to he and Xavier were excellent. So there was good signs out there, and you know, there's been a lot of work done in the in the, um, the preseason too. So you know, we'll kind of keep working at it this week and see where we are on Saturday. And then how much more control have you given CJ at the line of scrimmage? Um, you know, you try not to do too much. You know, just because someone can doesn't mean they, they you should because you want them to, to, to be clear and be thinking and just – you know, worry about executing the offense. And, you know, so we try to take as much off, off of our off of his plate as possible. But he's very intelligent, so we can handle high levels of information and does a really good job in protection and the run game, changing plays when we need to to do that. But uh, just because he cut he can doesn't mean we should. And so I try to be um, you know very mindful of that. You have to scale him back because he's probably asking for more and more. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that, he and I talk about that a lot. You know, and you, typically we'll we'll put a lot in, and then every once in a while I say this is maybe. A little bit too much here. Let me just kind of go play, and we kind of go back and forth on that. And by the time Saturday comes, we come to a pretty good idea of, of what the game plan is going to be and what he's comfortable with. But that's. But but it is good to have somebody who's older who can give you honest feedback in that area, though, too. Yeah. Coach, um, I know Julian Fleming was listed as a game time decision. How close was he to get on the field? Yeah, he, he did, went through warm ups, and he was close, and it, it tore his heart out not to be in this game. Um, had an unbelievable offseason, did a really good job this preseason. Um, you know, tweaked something leading up to the game. and um, So we're hoping to have him back on Saturday. But as it relates to Arkansas State, what are the unique challenges they present to you? Uh, certainly a good coaching staff. Um, you know, good, good players who, you know, they've added some new pieces. When you look at some of the guys who have joined their team, you know, they come from very good programs. And so they have talent. Um, you know, got off to a good start last week. So, um, you know, and, and played some teams really tough last year. When you look at some of the teams that they played, uh, you know, they were, they were in those games, even though maybe their record wasn't as, as good as they wanted to. Um, and I know with that coaching staff, they're, gonna, they're much improved this year. So, um, you know, we got to do a really good job of, you know, getting ready for a noon kickoff because that's a lot different than it was last week and, and then uh, playing up to our standard. I realize that the goal is to win every game, right? But are there specific things you're trying to accomplish this week you know, as you, as you try to get into a good rhythm before you get in the hard conference play. Well, you know, I, I felt like last week was like a conference game. So we, we've been we've been working towards that the whole preseason. I mean, we were tackling, we were doing all of those stuff. Every, everything was in. Like it wasn't like um, we had time to kind of move along with that. But I think this week it's more about addressing the things that we didn't uh, do as well and continuing to build, trying to fix those things, build in other areas, and then. Um, and then, you know, I, I think we'll probably play more plays this week, too. So, um, you'll have an opportunity to just evaluate everybody a little bit more. Uh, third row middle, Andy Andrews, Buckeye Sports Bulletin. Uh, yes, a lot of, a lot's been talked about with how this defense sort of changes the picture for a quarterback uh, after the snap. But when you're talking about the front and how they're moving different pieces around, as an offensive play caller, what's difficult about that, this team against, and sort of what they can do with the jack position and how the front changes? Well, it, it, identifying what's happening is probably the biggest challenge is getting everybody on the same page. Um, and, you know, when, it, when you're having a hard time communicating and identifying what's going on, um, you know, it can, it can create confusion. And I think that happens sometimes. And so I think at the end of the day, what, what happens with this style of defense and Jim's philosophy is, is they make you work every play, the quarterback and the offensive line. Over your far right, play Hall on the SYX. Give it, uh, Ryan, the hype of that game, the build up, the months of mm -hmm. this is going to be the greatest thing ever, um, and the stakes of the game. How big a hurdle was that that you cleared? A huge, yeah, it was big. But um, so was every game around here. If you don't believe it, try losing it, you know. Um, but that being said, there was a lot of build up, like you said, uh, leading up to the game for sure. Um, you know, the game being at 7:30 and just seeing everybody there, skull session, the walk. Um, 
pregame. I mean, all of it. So, yeah, there's a lot. And so we, we try to be mindful of that with the players. And we try not to, um, you know, get them up, you know, too too early in, in, the, in the day. You know, it's kind of had to be steady with them and talk to them about the build up. And you have to be at your competitive excellence when the foot hits the ball. And that's mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And you can't just, uh, it's just like not going to happen, especially when you go into the swell session, you're doing the walk and you're, uh, you know, on the bus coming over here to the Woody for a walkthrough and you see all the people. It's easy to get yourself, um, you know, worked up for a game that doesn't kick off for another, you know, 10 hours or so. So uh, it was a long day. Uh, but to say, to, again, to see the way we played in the fourth quarter and to leave that game with a win um, was a job well done. And, uh, but that's behind us, and now we've got to move on. And your post-game reaction, was that jubilation, joy, or relief? Relief. <laughs> relief. <laughs> relief. Yeah. It's relief. Uh, uh, far right, deep, Andy King, WBNS, 10 TV. Uh, Coach, when you look at, uh, you talk so much about the scars on this team. And how much do you think those scars helped you get the job done last Saturday? I don't think there's any question. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. But I think that's that's life. You experience things, you learn, and you don't always appreciate things until you've had some things taken away from you. And that's kind of what happened to this team last year. You know, it happened to me, it happened to a lot of the players on this team, the veteran guys, and, and you learn from it. And it can do one of three things. You either crumbles you, you get through it, or it makes you stronger. And you decide how that outcome is going to be. And um, the way that our guys went through this offseason, um, I'm proud of that. And um, it's just a start, just one game, but it's a good start. When you looked at that sideline before the game, when you think of representing Ohio State, maybe you have some people that are interested in Ohio State. What's it like to see Buckeye Nation draw like that? Oh, it was huge, yeah. And, and I think that there's a huge part of Buckeye Nation that um, likes the way we played. You know, just gritty, tough, physical, 100th year anniversary in the shoe, a little bit of a throwback game maybe. Um, we tried it. We had a couple plays for the fullback. Didn't quite get to them, but they were they were ready. Um, we did get pretty big down in the red zone once. So um, I know Coach Trussell was looking for the power play. We didn't get that one in there. But um, but no, it was, it was great. And in the, in the atmosphere there was certainly electric and a lot of fun. So. Again, we still got seven more at home this year, but uh, but good start. Uh, front row middle, Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Yeah, Ryan, you, you said, we all know that you pointed to Notre Dame. Everyone knew that was the first game. No offense to Arkansas State, but nobody was doing that for this one. Uh, you talked about competitive excellence and stamina. Yeah. How do you, I mean, how big a test is that this week because look, this is not a marquee game? It's something that we've talked about in the preseason a lot, though, because we knew we'd be in. Um, situations where you, know, you have to bring it every week. And so now we'll, we'll drop on that. I mean, there's not going to be one of those surprises that we haven't addressed and said, man, we, it doesn't matter. We Every single week you got to bring it. Otherwise, you're, you don't have a chance to, to be a champion. So we're just going to drop on that and figure out where we're at. But I'm hoping that the maturity and leadership can lead the way this year, this week. And what was maybe something overlooked Saturday that really pleased you? Um, obviously, the passing game took a while and could really click the way you wanted, but is there something that just stood out to you? Um, I thought the locker room at halftime was excellent. I thought the sideline was excellent. Um, I thought the way – there was a clip after we threw the touchdown pass um, to Xavier in the end zone where all five linemen and Travion were absolutely going crazy. They were just so excited to score that touchdown. Um, and then just the excitement on the sideline afterwards um, and the way that our guys in the fourth quarter just had a look in their eye and um, the way that in the four minute coming back out there and they just like, they're not going to get the ball back. We're just going to find a way and then see the trade beyond the way he ran. He ran a guy over and then runs hard. Like they just weren't going to get denied. And that's something you can build on. Just a lot of positivity in there. Just a lot of talking, a lot of guys communicating with each other, you know, um, just a lot of positive vibes, trying to figure out solving the problems. Um, where, you know, I've been in locker rooms before where there's just not a lot of talking going on, you know. But but these guys, you know, they, they, there was energy in there. They were talking. They came out of the locker room with juice. And they just had a look in their eye that they weren't going to get denied. And again, that's that's what we were trying to build on this summer. Thank you, uh, Jerry. Uh, 
more fluid is the way I would describe watching CJ roll out of some of those situations and get to the edges, etc. Uh, did he work on that in the offseason? Did you press that, or did just for a second year starter, does it come a little bit more naturally? Uh, I mean, we, we certainly worked on his athleticism and, and tried to get him stronger and faster with Coach Mick, but and he did that. I mean, he really attacked the weight room this year, and you just feel it. But um, but no, I mean, we, we've been doing some throwing on the run, and we've been doing some some different things with him, and, and certainly worked on scramble drills. Uh, that's been a big emphasis for us, just with seven on seven and some of the things that we've done, and you know, with our defense doing a lot of drop eight. We had to, you know, with the three man rush, if if they're going to drop eight, you know, there's only three guys in rush, so to identify that at times and then you know extend the play makes sense, and it's something that we have worked on some, but a lot of it has to do with him just feeling the game and. And, and seeing it. Yeah, I got about 50 questions. I'll ask you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Xavier Johnson, not only did he go in at that moment, but he he was up for the moment because obviously in that touchdown, I think they blitzed both safeties yeah. for the first time all game. Yeah. Maybe I'm yeah. wrong. No, you're right. What what does that just tell you about his awareness? And uh, obviously CJ has had that for a while. Now. Yeah. What, no, what, what, what just piqued you about that? Well, it was zero pressure and competitive excellence game on the line. They, like you said, they brought both safeties in the A-gaps from depth, and uh, they both recognized it. Yeah. Xavier did a great job of setting up the safety. Uh, CJ drifted away from the pressure. You know, got bought a little bit of depth. Sometimes you kind of have to throw that off your back foot, and you try to give a little air out there. Um, very well executed in that moment. But, uh, yeah, no, that was, was well done. Does, does that give him more consideration down the road now? That yes. That was up to the moment? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Because you never know until you get in there. Yeah. And to see him play like that, he caught two balls in a row in a big moment. Um, so, Absolutely. The last thing, uh, what what did it mean to you, and you touched on it a minute ago, to go to Jumbo there down the goal line? Y'all had had a third and two in the first half, didn't get it done, got stuck. What did it just do for you and this offense of getting something looks like fixed that y'all had trouble with last year? Yeah, it was huge. And, and just, again, I thought it was the attitude of just getting pads down. Um, because it, it, at the end of the day, there's going to be extra guys in the box, right? We all know that. So. It's at one point, at some point, you got to get your hands inside. You got to get your pad level low, and you got to beat your man. You got to block your man, and then there'll be an extra guy there that the running back has to run over. But that's at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. So um, I thought we had that that mentality down there, and so we got big and um, you know tried to hammer it in there. We did. And final questions. Uh, second row, Rick, Dustin Maurice, please. Ryan, um, next year when you guys play Notre Dame, it, it won't be the opener. I think it's week three next year. Just. Now that you guys have gone through it, can you just reflect on when you play a top five team in your opener, how the prep is different, mm -hmm. how you guys come in Sunday after a physical game like that? How different is it playing a team that good in week one when you don't have preseason games or anything like that? Yeah, well, you, you, you're forced to uh, be really good in preseason. Um, we had two scrimmages where we did a lot of tackling. Um, and you're, you're, you're in this balance of figuring out how do you get your team tough and game ready to play at a high level because it's such a huge game and have such an impact on the rest of the season, but also keep your guys healthy. Um, so uh, just a lot of communication between um, Mick Marotti and I over and over and over again. I mean, we're in practice. I mean, he'll get the GPS numbers on somebody. We, we'll pull those, these out, get them out. He's already run too much. Or we look hard and, and think go over and over and over again how much hitting we should do, how many plays in practice we should have. And so... Uh, between he and I, and, and then obviously talk to the coaches about their opinion on things. But we just try to figure that part of it out so that they can be at competitive excellence on that night. And uh, and, and I'll give the players credit. They, they believed because it was a hard camp. It was not easy. We went hard. We were physical. Um, but I think we had them ready. you got to play the schedule you're given. All things being equal, when you're playing a big-time non-conference matchup like that, prefer week two or three as opposed to the opener? or could um, when are you asking me? Now? Great idea. <laughs> Friday afternoon? Terrible idea. Um, and when you look at this schedule, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to go a little picture off the big picture. Listen, 12 team playoff is coming. You know, you guys, that world's coming. You look at Wisconsin and Penn State and Michigan State and Michigan and <laughs> all the games you guys have in front of you. Yep. Right now, as you just played a top five team, um, how hard can a team go how many times a year where you're, could you play a top 25 team every week in college football? Like the NFL, you're playing a great team right. every week. It's very easy. Or when guys are in class and they're 19 years old, 
do you have to play some games where you're not playing a top 25 opponent because of mental and emotional and physical wear and tear plays? Like what, how tough can it be every week? Um, I think that's a great question. I, I don't think I have really the answer to that because we really haven't done that before. So I, I, I'd be kind of speculating. Um, but it's something to think about for sure. I just haven't quite considered it, you know. Um, but it's interesting, and I think that those are all the really good questions that are coming up as we head into this format, yeah. You feel, right now, you guys just won that game. Yeah. How much do you think this team feels it right now, right? Like, what, how long is the physical, mental... Well, to get back at them. yeah, well, that, that, that's why we talk so much about competitive stamina, because no matter who you play, we have to play the same way, period. And so when you have that mindset going into a season, that's different than like you're saying, where it's like, okay, I got to get up for this game, but then over here I can take a deep breath. We, we, we cannot do that. You do that, that's how you get yourself set up. And I think that's where, why the theme this year has got to be competitive stamina. Bring it every single week, no matter who you're playing whether it's the number two team in the country, number one team in the country, or somebody that's not ranked, you've got to be yourself. And so we've got to bring it 12 times in a regular season regardless of who we're playing. And I think you have to really hammer that mindset before you head into the season. You can't just talk about it week three. Um, and we've been talking about it a lot. So we'll see where we're at. You hinted, though, what is your, what is your opinion of the 12-team proposed playoff? I mean, I think it's exciting. I think it's really exciting. But I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done to figure out a lot of things. Um, but um, that's why we have the best athletic director in the country to figure those things out, not me. <laughs> uh, Coach, thank you very much. Thank you. So, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, coming off of two productive days, you know, us getting here Sunday as a staff, uh, putting the Buffalo game behind us, our team getting in yesterday. Um, again, going through our weekly quality control um, and then starting on our preparation for Charlotte. Um, yesterday as a team, you know, I don't think anybody in our building uh, comes away from our first game, you know, satisfied that we played uh, to the best of our abilities, though I do think there were some, some good things done in the game. Um, from top to bottom, I thought all three phases did some nice things within the game. The emphasis of us establishing an efficient run game, I felt we were able to do that in, in the game Saturday. Uh, we missed some things in the passing game, which will get worked on. Um, defensively, you know, I like the way we played defense in the front seven. Uh, for the most part, defended the back end, uh, limited the big plays, and then on special teams, being able to uh, create some momentum with some big returns and, and got great great uh, contribution from our kicking game. Um, as with all Mondays, we put that game behind us pretty quickly because of the short turnaround to prepare for our next opponent. Um, you know, the tough thing about this week for us is our first road game together as the 22 football family. And as we all know, it's always tough to win on the road. Uh, our team is uh, looking forward to the preparation that takes place Monday through Friday to give us a chance on Saturday. And, you know, for us, how we prepare doesn't change based on the opponent each week. It's uh, what we do. It's the DNA of, of what we feel we need to do to put out a team on Saturday that's going to have a chance to be successful. Um, I'm looking forward to getting on the practice fields today, Tuesday and Wednesday are our big uh, work days uh, where the, the brunt of our game plan goes in. Uh, for the most part, we got out of the game pretty healthy, um, which is a good thing. Our captains for this week, um, Colton Spangler, Tyler Baylor, as well as Jalen Duncan will be leading us down there. Um, and, and before I open up for questions, I definitely want to give a, a huge shout out to Francis Tiafo. Um, for the big win yesterday against Rafa. Uh, it was great to see him have a breakthrough a match like that and really proud of him having gotten a chance to know him over the last five, six years. Uh, he's been a dear friend of our program. So congratulations to Francis as well. Mike, you've said over the years that the biggest improvement of a team is from week one to week two. Where, what big and what big picture and what little things are you looking to see a little bit better from week one to week two this year? You know, I think overall the efficiency on offense, um, if you look at it, to have 13 um, thirds down situations, and I'd say over half of them were second and extra long situations, whether it was penalties, uh, negative plays, you know, we can't be what I call a big little offense. Um, I like us to be efficient. If you look at that opening drive we had where we went down and scored, that's the efficiency I feel we need to play with where we're 
getting four or five yards and then we get a big play and then we keep that momentum. I felt too much on Saturday that there were some big, big little plays where we hit a big play and we'd have two negative plays. And, you know, to play good on offense, it, it, you have to stay ahead of the chains, which means staying out of the second and extra long situations, which puts you in tough third down situations, which we were in all, year, all game long. Um, from a, a defensive standpoint, we talked about it after the game, um, haven't watched the tape. It's just playing the deep ball. We were in good position. I thought there were a couple times some of the young corners panicked and uh, didn't necessarily play the technique. But um, you know, those are the things that I'm looking for, seeing us make those strides where all three phases uh, get better from week one to week two. And uh, I think we will. Mike. Um how much did, did Roman Hemby use last year to kind of get himself ready for a bigger role? And, and what kind of stood out to you in the offseason and preseason as to what's made him a good option, number one option for you? you know, I think Roman and all of the young backs, you know, including Antoine Littleton, um, you know, took it full advantage of, you know, the red shirt year. Um, we were very strategic, strategic in how we redshirted those guys by playing them throughout the course uh, without burning the red shirt and you know Roman and both Antoine both had pretty pretty big bowl games for us they both scored touchdowns and were efficient running the ball and I think you saw both of those guys benefit from a year in the weight room with RD our strength coach uh, uh, sitting in those meetings even you know those extra 15 practices we got during the bowl game definitely benefited guys like those guys. Antoine Littleton basically remade his body, went from a 295 pound running back to 239 pound and ran with great power, strength, and um, really like what I saw out of him as well. Um, so, you know, I think they all benefited from those extra practices. Um, going in the spring with the emphasis we put on the run game, especially with the receivers being injured throughout spring ball, I think uh, the timing of our run game and the comfort level we have with the offensive line and, and all the running backs really showed up on Saturday. I like a few more opportunities for those guys, which, I, you know, as I said uh, at the press conference Saturday will come when we convert those third down situations or get into the third and me uh, medium or shorts that allow us to sustain some drives. Coach, kind of sticking with Roman Hemby here, we saw what he could do, just a glimpse of it on the field this past Saturday. In terms of his character and, you know, what he brings to the locker room, can you give us a little peek into that as well? You know, Roman is one of those guys that is very unselfish. Um, he's exactly uh, the poster child for what you want um, out of a Terp. Uh, he's a guy that goes to class. He's a guy that helps us on special teams. And, you know, here you got your starting tailback running down, covering kicks and doing all the little dirty work, the little things that a lot of people don't want to do. And um, to me, that's kind of the DNA of what we're developing as a team, a bunch of guys that are like Roman Hemby when it comes to the unselfishness. Uh, that comes along with you know putting the team before yourself, and uh, I think Roman is an exemplary uh, uh, example of what we want all of our team, to, all of our team to be like, and, and we're starting to get there. Hey, coach, wanted to get your thoughts on Delmar Glaze's performance. How did you feel he held up? You know, DJ, I think, graded out pretty highly for us uh, coming out of the game on Saturday. Uh, he did have one holding call there on the outside zone play. Um, where it's just a matter of keeping his hands tight and inside and moving his feet. But, you know, DJ's a guy that's played a lot of football for us as a young player and um, has a really bright future. I see him on the same type of trajectory that both our other tackles, Spencer and Jalen, kind of took with him maybe a little ahead of schedule, especially with how much he's been able to play and play at a high level for us. Um, when you look at Dante Trader and, and you talk about the leadership down the middle and to have such a, a young guy stepping into such a big role, what, what traits does someone like him have to have to be successful and, and be able to earn that job? You know, I think it comes from confidence. You know, when you lead as a young player, it starts with your confidence. And I think confidence comes from knowing your assignments, uh, understanding what it is we're asking you to do. When you have that confidence, it kind of shows out now and it allows you to now have an impact on the other players. And unfortunately, the safety position, much like the quarterback position, comes with uh, leadership attached to it. Um, here, uh, a young player, uh, we try to develop leadership within our team, and that's why we created the leadership council that he's been a part of since he's been here on campus. You know, the biggest thing that jumps out is when you're not afraid in this day and age, peer pressure runs society. And Dante's not one of those guys that's uh, afraid to call out a teammate, older, younger, uh, doesn't matter if they're not necessarily living up to our standard. And to me, 
if we continue to have a lot of guys like Dante Trader, we'll continue to build this program to win win championships. Hey, Coach, you mentioned Francis Tiafo in the open. Um, I was uh, curious specifically what your relationship is like with him and what his relationship is like with the program and how he represents the area, even though he didn't go to the school. Yeah, you know, he's a guy that grew up right down the road at the uh, Junior Tennis Center. Um, I've gotten to know Francis probably since he was 14, 15 years old. And uh, when I came back here as a head coach, uh, he reached out uh, through mutual people. And um, I kind of see myself as a mentor. Um, he spends a lot of time here in our facility when he's – uh, in town, uh, I know our training room. We uh, laugh because, you know, yesterday during practice, I saw our trainers all on their phones, and I said, "Listen, we got guys practicing, and, and you know, they they take good care of Francis when he's here in town, and uh, he's been a great supporter of Maryland football. He's friends with some of the former players and current players. He's one of those guys like myself that loves everything DMV, and so uh, it's good to have guys like him around. Um, you know, he, he was looking for an opportunity to have a breakthrough win. Uh, I kind of see us in that same trajectory where we're a team that's kind of grinding in the dark that will continue to um, push through and, you know, hopefully get one of these breakthrough wins like he had yesterday. Coach, Jayshon Jones, he had a really big first half, some explosive plays. Just talk about what it means to have him back in the offense after battling back from injury for the second time now. Yeah, you know, he's the one guy that a lot of people don't talk about. And, you know, as I've said before, probably one of our – top receivers in terms from a fundamental standpoint and I'm glad that he was able to come back and, and healthy after, after battling you know two years of, of knee surgeries and still doesn't look like he's lost very much um, he is one of the guys that we count on to make plays for us on our offensive side of the ball when it comes to the tenacity you want to see a receiver play he's one of those guys that plays right there on the edge which I love because typically receivers aren't those type of players and you know, he kind of epitomizes what I want the young receivers to mimic when he goes in and blocks safety. If you watched the long run Roman had in the second half, he went in and dug out the safety and covered them up, blocked them. And, you know, those are the little things that you want to see your guys do without the ball in their hands. And, you know, Jay Sean has uh, been one of those guys from the day he stepped on campus that's made a lot of plays for this team. Hey, Coach. Uh, Ty Felton had uh, a lot of opportunities um, this, this past weekend. What have you seen from him so far that's allowed him to get those opportunities? You know, Ty was a guy last year that came on near the middle to the end of the season before he went out with a hamstring. And, you know, you can't deny the type of speed that he has. He's one of the guys that can take the top off the defense with his uh, speed. Uh, he's made a ton of plays, probably had one of the more productive training camps of all the receivers. And he took a lot of uh, reps because, obviously, with – Dante and Jay Sean being on pitch counts as we uh, bring them back the right way. He's kind of taken on quite a bit of that load. Um, you know, he's another a guy that will continue. I said it last week. I see us with pretty much six starters at the receiver position. When you, you know, look at how we're built there, um, he rotates in like the rest of those guys. He'll have opportunities because of his speed and really, really uh, for one of the younger guys has put himself in position to be a guy we can count on. Um, Coach, there are some programs who hardly ever play any non-conference road games. Do you think there's a benefit to going on a trip like this before conference play and, and you know, getting one under your belt? Or <laughs> would you prefer not I, to have I would prefer either? to be playing at home uh, <laughs> this week. Um, no knock on going down to Charlotte, which, you know, opportunity. It was on the schedule when I got hired here. Uh, as I've always said, we play the games that are there. Um, in a perfect world, you know, I think Maryland – we should be playing Charlotte here at home if we could. Um, unfortunately, these schedules are 10, 20 years out. I don't even know if I'll get to see my schedule because I think mine's don't start till 2035 or 2036. So um, just goes to show you where college football is nowadays. But no, great opportunity for us to go on the road together as a team, um, kind of get our feet wet on what it's like to go on the road where it's you against the crowd and the other team. And, you know, it'd be a great, great opportunity for us. Hey, uh, Coach, going back to the receivers, uh, Rakim Jarrett had a really good game offensively, but in the first quarter he had a really good play on special teams, acting as a gunner, and he tackled the punt returner. I just want, uh, what were your thoughts on that play? Because uh, he did a really good job flying down the field to make that play. Yeah, you know, that's something that I've been begging for out of this team, you know, you know, from the previous place that I've coached, you know, your best players are on the punt team and kickoff team. And I challenged our team with that because I think sometimes in college football, 
you know, very few players like Rakim come to Maryland to play the right guard on the punt team. They come to score touchdowns. And so, but if you look, and we pointed this out, you know, we went to the Raven uh, Titan game, and the first opportunity Chig got to be on the field was on punt return, kickoff return. And so, you know, in our uh, effort to develop our players, you know, we are selling them on the fact that it's important and that these special teams plays, like the punt team and kickoff team, are big plays for us and our best players should be on those two teams and so that's an example of rock being one of our better players and he went down and made a play on special teams that really created some momentum for us and so um, i'd like to see more running backs receivers uh, instead of just our defensive players especially because of the amount of plays that the defense plays we've got some big skill receivers big skill running backs that can help us on special teams and i think that was an example of it Hey, Mike, uh, in your review of Charlotte this week, what are some things that stuck out to you? They've got some playmakers that are maybe more indicative of how good they can be than their 0-2 record. Yeah, I think the big thing is us trying to figure out who the quarterback's going to be. I know both quarterbacks kind of have been in and, uh, in and out with injury. They're, the guy that started uh, missed last game, and then they brought James Foster in, who we know a little bit about, the A&M transfer from Alabama, uh, played last week, and it's kind of up in the air which one of those guys will be the – the, the, the quarterback, you know, they've got a transfer running back from Iowa that we know a lot about. We recruited him out of high school. It's a, a big time playmaker. Um, like everybody, they've kind of created, um, added depth and changed their team a little bit with some of the grad transfers and transfer portal guys. They got a guy from Central Michigan that's playing their DN Jack position. Um, you know, that really, number one, is a, a, does a good job. Zero's probably their best up front guy who's kind of created some some havoc. They brought a safety in from K-State, number five, that uh, uh, has seen in the two games we've scouted to be a really good player. So much like every team we faced, uh, especially early, they've got new players that they've brought in via the transfer portal. Uh, this is a program Coach Healy has done a really good job of building this program. They've had NFL guys come out of this program. Um, as I told our team, you know, the team you watch on tape isn't necessarily the team we'll see on Saturday because this is a team that doesn't have much to lose or anything to lose so that we'll get their best. And for us, it's a great test being on the road for the first time. That in itself makes it difficult. But um, I said this last week, and I'll say this every week, so you might as well make it a permanent quote. It's not going to be about who we play. It's about how we prepare, what we do Monday through Friday. That's going to really dictate what happens on Saturday for us. And so. How we prepare doesn't change based on Charlotte or Ohio State. I mean, it really doesn't. And for our team, we understand that. And that's, that's kind of what we've created, that type of culture. Mike, I'm sure you have more, <clears throat> more than a passing familiarity with Jared, Jared Bernhardt and the story that he had, you know, obviously playing lacrosse here, going to pro day with you guys, and then making the Falcons. Just what did you see from him from that experience, but also just how remarkable is it from a football perspective that a guy that hadn't played for four or five years goes from playing lacrosse and then 15 months later is making an NFL team? Yeah, not real surprising. I mean, you know, I've not been asked that question before, but I know I've taken a lot of heat every time he, he left here and won a national championship up at, uh, I think, Grand Valley State. Um, we actually evaluated him and, and we offered him an opportunity to play for us as a wide receiver. And uh, he decided he wanted to play quarterback. And for us, we had a quarterback. So I'm not surprised at all. We actually put him through a workout, um, showed the skill set. I watched him in our pro day. He, took, uh, he had his pro day here with us and our team. Uh, a great example of what it's like when you come to the University of Maryland. I mean, I'm not surprised because everything this kid touched turns to gold. And it's, it's in the DNA of the family. You know, I know a little bit about his dad who passed away, who worked with Billy O'Brien there at Houston. And so not real surprised that good things are happening to, to, to him because um, Jared's one of those special guys that good things always happen to guys that just work hard. He keeps his mouth shut, very humble um, type of player. So I'm excited for him. I saw his two brothers at our all staff meeting and told him that he made me look bad, but I did offer him an opportunity to play receiver for us, but he wanted to play quarterback. Thanks, guys. So, first of all, like always, appreciate you guys being here and, and covering uh, Penn State football. A uh, brief summary of the of the Purdue game. Some of this I've already covered, so I'll keep it brief. But um, you know, turnover battle on paper, it says it says even. 
Um, but obviously one of those turnovers uh, going for a pick six uh, changes that, although we did score points off of our defense's turnover as well. Um, penalties, uh, we were able to win that battle, uh, which, which again, being on the road and dealing with that noise in an opening game, uh, I think is a positive. Uh, drive start battle, we won that. Uh, the sack battle, we won that. Um, explosive plays, we, we did not. We did not. So got to improve in those areas. Uh, players of the game on offense, Olu Fashano and, and Kevon Lee. Uh, defensively, Joey Porter and special teams, Barney Amore. And then the uh, scout team or developmental squad players of the week were Mason Stahl and, and Vega Ioni. On uh, offense and on defense, Cody Romano and Andrew Sharga. And then on special teams, Cody Romano. Uh, obviously cool that uh, Sean Clifford was the co-offensive player of the, the week in the Big Ten. Uh, defensively, you know, Joey Porter was a national player of the week in the Bednarik Award, but he didn't get any Big Ten love for, for whatever reason. Um, you know, I thought, I thought we played hard. Uh, when you watch the game, I thought we played hard against a good team. Uh, I think that team's going to give a lot of people problems this year. Same team last year that beat number two, uh, uh, Iowa, and number five, Michigan State. Um, so they've, they've been in big games before. Uh, the thing that really jumped out to me in that game is we won situational football, the things that we work on all the time. Offense won a coming out, a sudden change a two-minute at the end of the half and a two-minute at the end of the game. Defensively, we want a two-minute at the end of the half and end at the end of the game and a four-minute to win the game. So I thought that was, that was a big positive for us. Um, opportunities for growth, obviously too many drop balls. I think the game could have been completely different uh, if, we drop, if we caught more balls, and that's on offense and defense. Um, and then we got to be more explosive. There's no doubt about it. We got to be more explosive on offense. So, uh, you know, I'm pleased overall. Found a way to get a tough, gritty win on the road. And, uh, you know, we were able to come in, practice on Friday, meet on Friday, get those things cleaned up. Uh, the players had off on Saturday, and then we went back to our normal uh, work week on Sunday. Uh, not completely normal because obviously we didn't have any corrections to make. Uh, talking about Ohio, uh, six uh, six game series with these guys. Uh, last time we played them was a loss in 2012. Um, you know, Tim Albin is the head coach. Uh, I don't really know Tim or this staff very well. Um, obviously, he's got he's got a tremendous resume and history there. Uh, Twelve returning starters uh, from last year. Thought they went out and played played really well in game one and did some really good things. Uh, so that'll be that'll be a challenge. You know, when you talk about when you talk about their offense, uh, Scott Isfering, Isferding, excuse me, uh, is the offensive coordinator. Um, you know, Curtis Rourke, their quarterback, stands out is also a captain for them. You know, they're a spread option attack offensively. Obviously, they kind of promoted from within and stayed in-house. Uh, so a lot of things that they did last year are still consistent this year. But Curtis Work, the quarterback, we're impressed with. Big, strong kid, high completion percentage. Uh, the wide receiver, James Bostic, and then the running back, who we're familiar with, is a local kid from Maryland, uh, Bangura. We've, we've been impressed with him. And then on defense, uh, Spence, uh, Spence Nowinski, um, they actually hired away from Miami, Ohio. Um, established defensive coordinator, be able to watch him in game one and then be able to go back and watch what they did at, at Miami of Ohio, I think was important. Obviously, you know, first games are challenging. Second games can still be challenging because you still don't have a whole lot of data to study. Uh, been impressed with their uh, Will Linebacker, number 32, Bryce Houston, defensive tackle, number 55, Rodney Matthews, and then strong safety, number 11, Tariq Drake, or guys that jump out. And then the last thing on special teams, uh, Nate Faunus uh, is their special teams coordinator. And uh, they got four starters returning on special teams. 
The punter or puntered last year, who's an Australian uh, young man we didn't see in the last game. I'm not sure if he'll be back this week or not. Um, but I thought their kicker, who's a freshman, did a really good job with his op times, and he was two for two. So tremendous challenge. Obviously, today's practice will be important. Um, I loved how our guys handled you know, both Friday's practice and Sunday's practice. We're a little bit ahead uh, because of that. But uh, you know, we mainly, at the end of the day, we got to get better this week. And that's, that's in every area, offense, defense, special teams, and also individually. If we do that each week as the season progresses, I think we'll like where we're at. Start with Rich Scarcella, Redding Eagle, and then we'll go to Ben Jones. Good afternoon, James. How are you today? Good, Rich. How are you, buddy? I'm okay, thank you. James, after watching film, how would you evaluate the performance of your offensive line? Yeah, I thought um, – I thought the majority of our offensive linemen uh, played played well. Um, we you know had I think one penalty on the offensive line and, and one sack, so we got to we got to clean that up. Um, watching the tape, we had a chance for a few more explosive runs. We had to make that one uh, free hitter miss, and we weren't able to do that. Um, but but we just got to continue to progress. But you know, one sack in the game, on the road, first game in the Big Ten. Um, I think we took a step, but there's still there's still work that needs to be done. Ben Jones, StateCollege.com. Then Corey Geiger. Hey James, how's it going? Hey Ben, good man. You? Uh, good. I've never gone this early before. It feels vaguely stressful. Um, Joey Porter Jr. Normally, when you talk about corners. You know, they say that the guys that you don't hear about are the guys that are maybe doing their job the best. It seemed like he got targeted a lot and, and certainly maybe historic, you know, the penalties and things like that led to that. But how do you kind of balance a guy who's getting targeted a lot, but at the same time, a guy who is having, you know, apparently a lot of success in those moments? Yeah, obviously it's uh, it's unusual uh, to have a guy that's as highly thought of as, as Joey and... Um, and I don't know if they necessarily targeted him, but they didn't avoid him. And a lot of times people will just go in a different direction. Um, but I just think they were just, they were just going to run their offense and do what they do and where the defense or the, you know, the quarterback's progression took them, they were going to go. Um, and I think, you know, this guy does as good of a job as anybody in terms of uh, throwing the ball. You know, both the, the head coach as the coordinator and the quarterback, they do a really good job at it. And Joey kept getting tested. And, uh, and as the game went on, you know, really, really played well. And um, I think his confidence continues to grow. And obviously, it's a great way for him to start the season, not just, not just with the, the PBUs, but also the tackles. Uh, and the next step really for him and for us, just like I talked about in the opening you know, comment, is about you know, drop balls. And that's, that's defensively and offensively because that game would have been very different uh, with a couple of those opportunities turning into interceptions and possibly pick sixes for us that I think we're capable uh, of, of doing. So, um, you know, great way for him to start the year. We're going to have to continue to build on it. Um, because I think that's the key, right, is, is the elite teams and the elite players. It's, it's about consistency. Corey Geiger, DK Pittsburgh Sports, then John McGonigal. I do apologize about this. I'm, I'm usually later, so sometimes I don't always ask about just the team. I wanted to ask you about college football playoff expansion, James. What do you think the benefits of that could be, and how, how might that change football? Uh, once that comes into play. Are there any negatives at all, too? Yeah, you know, in season, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time on this, and this obviously came out um, in season. Um, but obviously the playoff model has obviously changed college football. Uh, it really, really has. Um, and I would say that's that's really starting with the BCS and now, now our current model. Um, you know, but I do think I do think if you look at you know most of the sports in college football or sports in general, more opportunities for more teams to get in without going too far, 
um, I, I think is important. Um, you know, there's obviously always the discussion about teams, you know, maybe maybe uh, that are, aren't power five, you know, schools that had great years but are but are left out. Um, or a situation like us where, where we won the Big Ten championship, you know, arguably top two conferences, if not the best conference in, in all of college football, and be left out. Um, I think it helps resolve and, and solve some of those issues. Um, we obviously, in our sport, we also have to look at the length of the season, um, you know, from an from a academic calendar perspective, but also just from a physicality perspective. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, but I think in general, um, I think it's a, it's a positive and I think it's, it's, it's something it, that, it, that was needed. I, I'm also a believer that I don't think the answer, you know, not just in this, but in everything, I don't think the answer is always more is better. You know, we got to find the, the, the sweet spot for, for college football, for the fans, uh, and most importantly for the student athletes. John McGonagall, Penn Live, and then we'll go to Neil Rudell. Hey, James, how are you? Good, John, how are you? Good. Uh, so Theo Johnson, you know, he traveled, but he didn't suit up. Was there a chance he'd play against Purdue, and how is he holding up ahead of Ohio? Yeah, um, we were hoping that we may have him um, available in, in that Purdue game. Um, that's, not, that's not our call, um, but we were hopeful. Uh, travel and to see if there was a chance of that, and and we'll kind of go from there. But obviously, everybody knows how much of a big time player he is, and how much respect that we have for him, both on and off the field. Um, you know, so hopefully, hopefully, we're able to get him back sooner uh, rather than later. Hopefully, that's this week. It it did. You know, we had to we had to kind of scramble there because we had a big part of our game plan was twelve personnel and thirteen personnel and. You know, we had to scramble. The, the positive is it allowed us to get Efner some more reps rather than just at tackle. If you, if, you, if you watch the tape closely, he actually played like an extra tight end in some, in some sets for us, uh, which, which also allowed us to get him a little bit more playing time, which, which he's earned. Neil Rudell, El Tunamir, and then Mark Wiganrich. Hey, James, um, curious if, Hi, um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please Hi. Can... <laughs> hey, I was wondering if you could talk about the Rock, Dan Rocco's um, contribution to the staff and his son as well, and just the Rocco family's um, uh, link to Penn State football, maybe how much you know Frank as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, really cool. You talk about, you know, the dad, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's the grandfather, depending on who you're calling the dad, but the grandfather, the dad, the son, the brother, um, obviously long history, um, you know, with Penn State football. Um, obviously, you know, very aware of all those things. Um, and I think you guys have, have seen kind of with our staff uh, when we've been able to connect, you know, from a historical perspective, uh, you know, with some of the staff that we've been able to bring back, whether it's the Roccos or whether it's the Connors or whether it's the Zemitises, um, you know, um, I think that's been been important for us, Terry Smith, um, you know, to to help bridge that gap, you know, a place with unbelievable tradition and history, um, and for our players to be able to learn from these guys' experiences, and and for me. You know, to be able to hear some of these things in the past and, and how things were done and why um, has been, been really cool. So, you know, I've known the Rocco family for a long time. Obviously, you know, getting here um, to Penn State and getting to know the grandfather um, well. I, 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 to be honest, I mess it up sometimes. I call, I call Danny Frank uh, and call David Danny sometimes so in general I, it helps me if I just say coach and then whoever turns around I make eye contact with the guy I'm talking about um, but they've been great you know obviously when you're able to get that experience um, that head coach experience that NFL experience that Penn State experience there's tremendous value in that and then what really helped us a little bit um, you know with David is him and Ty Howell work together as well so it allowed me to 
um, you know, really kind of have an understanding. And I got a ton of respect for Ty Howell, who's another guy I didn't mention when we talk about all the lettermen we've brought back, uh, Tyrone uh, as well. Um, Ty Howell uh, worked, with, worked with David, so I thought that was helpful too. So it's been good. Mark Wilkenrich, all Penn State, and then we'll go to Mike Gross. Hi, James. How you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. There's a newly announced today NIL collective that was started by former football players and will benefit Penn State's football program exclusively, which is what it says. What kind of impact could that have for your team? Well, obviously, you know, first of all, we appreciate, you know, all the people, whether they're alumni or fans or donors, um, with with all of the you know with all of the nil opportunities and groups that are out there um obviously this one specifically you know wanted to work um you know with football um uh, the other the other the other groups are doing that as well um, but this is something that we want to make sure that those groups are working working together um doing what's best for Penn State and Penn State athletics as a whole. Um, but obviously certain people um, are going to have a connection with certain sports that they're more passionate about. So uh, we appreciate what they're doing. Obviously there's a lot of passion and hard work that's going to go into it. Um, you know, and obviously from a name recognition, um, from being very supportive with us, not only in this area, but really since we've been back, they've been, they've been great. Um, and uh, we look forward to you know, any opportunities that they can present to our student athletes and, and our program, uh, we are appreciative of, we really are. Um, I, also, I also wanna say we got, we got a ton of respect and appreciation for Success With Honor and what they're doing. And I think Pat has really kind of come in um, and I think has worked really well with these groups outside of the athletic department and, and making sure everybody's on the same page and we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. Last question on the uh, phone line will be Mike Gross, Lancaster Newspapers. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you, man? I'm good, thanks. Um, you, you, you've talked a lot about developing depth. You've obviously played a lot of people last week. Uh, quarterback is a unique situation. So how likely is it that you would give a backup quarterback a, a series, not in a mop-up situation, but in a real live competitive game situation over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, we've, we've had discussions about that. You know, obviously, um, you know, obviously we want to make sure um, that we have depth throughout our entire program. Um, at every position, you know, obviously I think the last two years, uh, that, that had a major factor, uh, in how our seasons went. So being very strategic and working hard to, to find ways to get guys on the field and gain that experience, not only in practice and our developmental scrimmages that we, we just had this one this past Sunday, uh, but also out there in Beaver stadium, you know, that I think in theory, I think what we've tried to do is is you know, hopefully play in a way in, in in some games that allows you to get guys on the field, um, you know. But it always doesn't play out that way. So being strategic, uh, the best we can uh, to to put all of our players at every position uh, in position to gain that valuable game experience. So it's something we're looking at. Uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. We'll open up some questions here in the room. Raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Hey, James, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing good. Uh, how would you evaluate, you mentioned that winning the sack battle, how would you evaluate your defensive ends pass rushing, specifically Adisa coming off the injury and Chop in his debut? Yeah, I thought, uh, again, you know, when, when the game got there to the end and the quarterback had to hold on to the ball, um, we were able to, to get home and, and make some plays. Um, but you, when you look at this team, we knew going into it that batted, batted down balls were going to be as, as significant maybe as, as what sacks normally are based on how quickly the ball comes out of the quarterback's hands. So I thought that was 
you know, that was something that we really kind of emphasized and, and were focused on. Um, but overall, good. Obviously, at the end of the day, you'd like more tackles for loss and you'd like more sacks. Um, but again, based on who you play, what their scheme is like, you know, you, you play a team like Wisconsin who's going to run the ball 80% of the time and then hard play action pass and be in manageable third down situations, they typically aren't going to give up a bunch of sacks. You play a team like Purdue where the ball's coming out very quickly, whether it's screens, quick game, um, RPOs, things like that, um, it's, it's going to impact it. But at the end of the day, you know, we want to get people off schedule, and the way you do that is with tackles for loss and sacks. Hey, James, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, after looking at film this weekend, how would you describe the secondary's performance? Obviously, Joey Porter Jr. had a good game, but how would you describe uh, how the other guys played? Yeah, I think really good. You know, um, when you when you talk about, you know, I think we actually had it different. You know, um, the number of pass breakups that we had. You know, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're in the away stadium, the way they the way they chart it is different than you. And it's not like you can call back and make your argument and they really want to have it, you know, the, the following week. But I think if I'm correct, I'm trying to check my notes here. I think we had us down for 14 pass breakups is the, the way I th 16. Thank you. The way we had it graded. Um, so, you know, we thought we played really well against a team that is going to test you and your and your pass game. They're going to test you. Um, so I thought under the circumstances played well. Uh, the area obviously that I that I've mentioned already um, that we gotta we gotta be better at is is when we have an opportunity for for a turnover for an interception. Um, you know we got to capitalize on that. Very similar to when we have an opportunity for a sack. You know we got we got to capitalize on on them as well. Um, but, but taking all that into consideration, well, there's, there's room for, for improvement. James, the, uh, two defensive positions that we spent a lot of time asking you in preseason about were middle linebacker and safety. Keaton got the start, Tyler got the start, but there were others involved. Would you be able to kind of share your evaluation through one game on, on those two spots and the plan moving forward? Yeah, so. I think our plan, and we haven't talked about it for this week yet, um, but, you know, Abdul Carter, we were expecting him to play a decent amount in, in that game, um, and it, it was really dependent on how he was going to play. Um, with it being his first game, we didn't want to have a strict rotation, um, but but obviously him, I think he ended up playing two plays, one on special teams and, and one on defense. Uh, our plan was for much more than that. So this week, uh, I'd like to get him a, a ton of reps, both on special teams and on defense. And then obviously this game will have a better, give us a better feel of, of how that rotation will go moving forward. I think the plan is probably still the same with Elston and, and Kobe to rotate that. Uh, by series, whether it's one to one or two to two, um, and then at the other outside linebacker spot. It Latest AP Top 25 is here. Penn State receiving votes. Ohio State falls down to number three. We'll have all of these rankings and more coming up tonight on the Big Show. And that'll do it for this Tuesday press conference edition of Big Ten Live. I'm Rick Pizzo. Don't forget, join me for that big show along with Jake Butt at 6 o'clock Eastern.